American Cult Christianity Part 33. Why are there so many strange American cults today? The assault on the gospel essential of justification by faith alone. Hello, this is Joe Franklin of SparrowMinistry.com. This is a continuation of my new YouTube series on American cults and their beginnings. This ongoing and vital series called American Cult Christianity asks the question, why are there so many strange American cults today? Again, the short answer is the assault on the gospel essential of justification by faith alone. This aspect of our salvation and foundational gospel truth is the number one target of the enemy and has been ever since the church began on the day of Pentecost. And we've been learning about a number of non-Christian cults and cults of Christianity that were birthed during the Second Great Awakening in 19th century frontier America. All of these groups still infect the Christian church today, with far too many Christians being unable to understand just what is it that makes these groups un or no un <laughs> unorthodox. Let's find out. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, disclaimer, this YouTube channel is dedicated to the study of controversial groups and movements, some that have been called cults, sparrowministry.com. So I'm going to read, I'm going to start out, folks, and I'm going to read uh, something out of Campbellism, It's History and Heresies by Bob L. Ross of Pilgrim's Publication. He is still alive, by the way. Um, I asked Larry Wessels of Christian Answers TV. And he told me that. What a wonderful blessing. So this is taken from the memoirs of Alexander Campbell by Robert Richardson, son-in-law of Campbell. So I'm going to read some of Ross's book starting on page 31 and 32 on Campbell as the master spirit. And this will uh, give you a big heads up. Excuse me as I reach over uh, as to what we're going to be talking about today. Alrighty, okay, Memoirs of Alexander Campbell by Robert Richards. Okay, we already did that one. Now, this is Alexander Becomes Master Spirit. I think it's chapter 5, uh, page 31. Uh, this is Ross. From, from the time that Thomas Campbell spoke at his baptism, rehearsing his experiences leading up to it, Richardson says, quote, the positions of the father and son were reversed, and each tacit, tacitly occupied the position allotted to him. Alexander became the master spirit, and to him the eyes of all were now directed. He felt that providence had placed him uh, in the advance. Memoirs, Volume 1, page 402. I'm going to continue here. Uh, I'm quoting now from his memoirs, uh, according to Robertson here. Quote, Mr. Campbell found himself to be the center of a constantly widening circle of influence and under providence an acknowledged guide to a large and intelligent community zealously engaged in the work of reformation. Memoirs, volume 2, page 350, 395. In a funeral address... Uh, let's see, this is uh, Ross now. In a, funeral, in a funeral address by the Campbellite Moses Lord, interesting name, uh, after the death of Alexander Campbell, we find this statement, funeral address. Now, this is in his memoirs now, quote, and this is Robertson now. So Ross is qu quoting Robertson, quote, as his own conceptions of this blessed book I'm assuming the Bible began to assume accuracy and definiteness. He began to mold and shape the thoughts of others. Immense crowds flocked to his appointments to hear him. They were delighted with his noble plea for the Bible and Bible alone. As he taught men how to read it, for at that time let it astound none, men did not know, their appreciation of it arose. That's page 25 from Memoirs. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, and it goes on. Uh, this is uh, Ross here on page 32, uh, with Alexander being the acknowledged guide, 
and that's in quotes, that's one from his memoirs. The master spirit, that's in quote, that's also from his memoirs. The, in quotes, provid providentially placed, end of quotes, leader and teacher um, of how to, quote, quote unquote, how to read the Bible, that's in his memoirs, to whom, quote, the eyes of all were now directed, end of quote. So is it, it's no marvel that the church started by the Campbells has always been called, and rightly so, Campbellite Church. Such eulogies as are here quoted are just samples of how, of how highly Campbellites regard their master spirit, even though many of them today are ashamed to talk about him. <laughs> and so that's the end of Ross's uh, excerpting of the Campbellite uh, memoirs according to Robertson. So interesting stuff, interesting stuff. Okay, outline the Holy Scriptures in the Church of Christ. Man, I'm excited about this one. I'm sipping on my coffee here. Mm -mm -mm. Excuse me, this is part one of three. Now, this is part 33 here. If you'll see on the outline, we're just going to do one, two, three, four, and a little bit of five. First section, principles for interpreting the Bible. Two, background and history. Three, the gospel lost and then discovered. Hey, there it is over in the corner. Get it, me bucko. Swat it with the broom. Like you'd see a mouse or something scurry out into your living room, right? It's there. It's not there. Okay. Uh, four, Church of Christ uses Alexander Campbell as an inspired source of truth. And uh, five, Campbell's writings are in practice the interpreter of scripture. Super important stuff. At the bottom, uh, wonderful uh, human being and wonderful disciple of Christ, John MacArthur, quote, anytime you have a salvation theology based upon God and man, you can never be absolutely sure of your salvation. Why? Because if my salvation depends upon upon both God and me, I might mess up, John MacArthur, save beyond a doubt. So the cults don't have eternal security and no assurance. Everything is tied and tethered to uh, their works, uh, maintaining their justification through works. Terrible bondage. So all cults, by the way, in some comments, all cults teach that there are in fact two sources of authoritative truth in the church today. This is going to be really hard. If you're a Campbellite, you're not going to like this. If you're anyone else, you know how messed up this church is. You understand that it's a cult, the legalistic, patternistic arm, and you're just saying, amen, brother. So, mm -mm -mm. so anyhow, there's two sources of truth in the church today. Number one, the Bible. Yeah, 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 the Bible, they'll say. But two, and this is what they're not going to admit to, the writings of their founders these quote-unquote inspired and prophetic writings or ancient gospel discoveries are a continuing and authoritative source of truth for them. These beliefs and ideas directly contradict the gospel of Jesus Christ. The cults will never admit to this second source of truth, as I was saying. A person must first understand the true Christian gospel and they must be able to recognize that some of the key distinctives of their group are unbiblical and contradict the gospel. If they understand these two things, they will be set free. This YouTube channel is about setting people free to enjoy their walk with God as he intended. Galatians 5.1, Philippians 3.9. So let's learn some new things today. What else would you like me to teach you about God's word, says the Campbellite? Mm. Hmm. <laughs> okay, no thanks. Okay, so in the blue there, do the Church of Christ hold to their fundamental belief that the Holy Scriptures are their soul? source of authority and that's what we're looking into a three-part series this will be uh, interesting and i hope that the arm of the lord is not too short to save if you're caught up in one of these cults i know that you're in denial uh, those caught up in work salvation are in strong denial that they're following anything other than the word of god They've been taken captive. Okay, so on the right, Mr. Campbell was a student of John Locke. 
Okay. Reason, rationalism, and scientific method led Mr. Alexander Campbell to co- and then I'm, I'm talking about Campbell, I'm talking about Alexander, not so much Thomas. So anyhow, led Mr. Campbell to codify the following slogans. Thy we go by the Bible only, he says, in his Scot-Irish uh, immigrant accent. Thy book, chapter, and verse, me buckos. Hi, me laddies, we call Bible things by Bible names. <laughs> No creed but Christ. Okay. All right. Quote, the silence of scriptures. Okay. Well, then why you be talking all the time and talking when the Bible is uh, said otherwise? Anyhow, so we must understand that the Bible is a testimony of the, nat- of the nature and purpose of God. Let me adjust my screen. It has the stamp of God's plan of redemption. We should read and study the Bible using laws of hermeneutics, context, context, context. Only then will we have a clear, broader understanding of God. Refu slide at the bottom if you'd want to brush up and bone up real quick on your uh, Enlightenment thinking, 1800s, and the influences of Campbell. You'll very uh, uh, quickly see uh, how he uh, got caught up in heresy, part 25. Thomas Campbell, by the way, uh, there to the right, he wrote the 1809 Declaration and Address. I think this was the second cultic document and manifesto that came out of this uh, this group. I think it was uh, uh, Dead as a Stone, Barton Stone, that wrote the actual first uh, document of this uh, cult. Anyhow, it became uh, an embryonic creed, even though Campbell just got done saying, No creed but Christ! Okay, well, this is a creed of the Restoration Movement, and this is straight from his Memoirs of Alexander Campbell, Volume 1, pages 85, 88, Bob Ross. Okay, so some comments on our uh, little fellow there, this uh, uh, gentleman, this human creeds, and he's going to tell you all about the Campbellite Church. Campbellite Church of Christ's position. Well, we use only the Bible to formulate doctrines. We do not have confessions, catechisms, creeds, or other man-made writings to formulate doctrines. And that's a quote uh, tre- directly uh, taken uh, from some of their websites. So let's look into this to see if this proposition is really true. And by the way, a creed is simply a belief. <laughs> so every denomination has creeds. And legalism will make you out to be the worst of hypocrites. So buckle up. This may not be pleasant if you are an active Campbellite. Mm. Excuse me. Okay, so history and data show that since the early 1800s, the Church of Christ has become one of the most splintered, fractured, and floundering of the professing non-denominational sects. Jesus said, you'll know them, frauds and false teachers, by their fruit. Okay, The ancient order train has left the station, and it's been careening out of control ever since. They're big into that. It's the ancient order. We discovered that lost gospel. There it is, right? Get out the broom and try to swat it, can it, package it, sell it. Okay, so the following is a fundamental belief or creed taken from a Church of Christ website on their doctrines. It reads, quote, The Bible shall be considered as the standard of authority for every spiritual matter. Hold on, I'm not done with the sentence, folks. There's another sentence. It shall be interpreted using the approved method of command, example, and necessary inference. Oh, my God, there it is. Hermeneutical lie of CEI, end of quote, of course. So silence of scriptures on any manner is to be construed as a forbiddance of such. This is Church of Christ, forbidden. So, however, this rule shall not be applied to matters considered to be helpful in obeying any other commands, such as church buildings and their necessary furnishings. End of quote. So I kind of messed it up there. There's a quote, and then that other stuff on silence of scriptures. Well, they've also say that, you know, listen, and it's all this forbidden stuff, silence of scriptures, and they just add whatever they want. So, no creed but Christ, along with diluted notions and claims of infallibility, such as, quote, where the scriptures speak, we speak, where the scriptures are silent, we are silent, end of quote. Well, this declaration and address is the first Campbellite creed. And that's part 25 at the bottom. See that document in the middle? That's their cultic manifesto. 
Thomas Campbell Declaration and Address. No creeds, but then they go on and on and on, and their websites are full of hundreds and hundreds of creeds. Hypocrites. Okay, first uh, little section there, and we're going to talk about principles for interpreting the Bible. Hmm. Good coffee. Okay, so Prince, and you always have to go back to this. How does a group interpret the Bible? That's where a lot of the mistakes are made, besides having a bad heart. Okay, the human heart is also the breeding ground. So, I love it. Look at that caption there. It says, if you believe, if you believe on me, I will save you. If you mess up, I will unsave you. Uh, by the way, there's no assurance or eternal security in the cults. They don't teach them. They're extremely anti-Calvinistic, anti-theological, anti-Reformation. It all comes down to the following motto. I am saved in part by what I do. Okay. Things Jesus never said, by the way. Okay. So uh, bull uh, the bullets there in the gray on the left. The manner in which a church understands, interprets, and applies the Bible reveals whether or not that group uses scripture as its sole foundation for doctrine and practice. Next bullet. A broad spectrum of, spectrum of scholarship views the teaching of the Church of Christ as based upon a superficial interpretation of the Bible and is fundamentally in error. And you'll want to revive, uh, review part three if you'd like, the hermeneutical lie of CEI and where all that bad fruit got started. Above that, enlightenment thinking. Two, rationalistic patternism. Three, Church of Christ, see the Bible as a rule book. That's how serious uh, scientifically looking at the Bible under um, enlightenment thinking, Locke and Bacon and all that. That's what it led to, all those errors there. Okay, let me see if I can, uh, no notes on this one, so I'm just going to keep going. All right. Okay, so uh, second uh, slide there, uh, principles for interpreting the Bible. And that uh, flyer that um, really uh, cultic uh, propaganda, you might say, is an actual Church of Christ flyer from what I understand. It was 40 cents at the time. I just pulled it right off the internet, the one true church. And... Um, it literally says at the top, doesn't it, the one true church. So that's one of the reasons why they're a cult. Theologically, they're a cult. They've added uh, works to salvation. The second reason they're a cult, uh, and you can add the Seventh-day Adventists, International Church of Christ, the two-by-twos, Cooneyites, all these other uh, groups, uh, a dozen of them or so that were spun up. Uh, from the false set of beliefs and teachings of Alexander Campbell and the Restoration Movement. Those uh, groups that were uh, spun up are also cults. They all point the finger at each other and everyone else saying, hey, we're the true church and nobody else is saved. But here you have it. It's an actual flyer. <laughs> oh, it just It's just uh, something else. Okay, so bullets. Campbellites insist they do not follow Alexander Campbell because he was a mere man, man. They just, they, hey, we're just following Jesus. <laughs> okay, all right. Next, yet Alexander Campbell and the Restoration Movement are virtually synonymous. So <laughs> good luck trying to decouple from that. A popular Campbellite motto says, we have no creed, which really means they have no official confession of faith like the other denominations <laughs> but that last bullet there many of their beliefs have been put into print and distributed in the form of tracts journals and booklets in fact what is the church of christ by baxter lists 20 distinct doctrines and practices you can review that part 12 slide at the bottom there the jewel miller film strip evangelist series that film strip and it's also in print. I've got a copy of it. Literally, literally was there and is there to this very day for one purpose only, to convince people that the Church of Christ is the one true church and everyone else has got it wrong. So if that's not a cult, I don't know what is. Mm. Some comments. So the foremost of all doctrinal writings within the Campbellite Church of Christ used for the purpose of catechesis, indoctrination, is the five-volume sets of books entitled Sound Doctrine. So here's some other, uh, you know, they say, well, you know, uh, you know, you know, we're only following Campbell, there's no creeds and this and that, we don't, you know, <laughs> okay. 
Anyhow, it's a five-volume set of books entitled Sound Doctrine. Okay, These books were written by Charles Reddy Nicole and were copyrighted by Nicole Publishing Company in Clifton, Texas, written in the 1920s. This set has served as the primary work of doctrinal formulation within the Campbellite Church of Christ. And I've already told you about their cultic video series, the Jewel Miller film, film strip series. Now, another primary text used for catechesis is the three volume set entitled Hardeman's Tabernacle Sermons, the hard truth with Hardeman, right? <laughs> Okay, so Nicholas Brody Hardiman is perhaps the most revered preacher within the history of the Church of Christ. During March and April in 1922, Hardiman delivered a series of sermons in Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. Really cool place. I've been blessed to be there. And uh, his sermons are included in the set. So, therefore, take this to the bank now, therefore, the Campbellite Church of Christ position, quote, we use only the Bible to formulate doctrines. We do not have confessions, catechisms, creeds, or other man-made writings to formulate doctrines, end of quote, is false. <laughs> it's just more cult mythology. Next uh, category of our outline two, background and history. So there he is. There's your Campbellite. And maybe you can substitute your Seventh-day Adventist or whatever, an elder in a suit, right? Boy, they're really going to tell you the truth. Man, I'm going to look up to him. Well, we go by the Bible only, say the Campbellites. Book, chapter, and verse. We call Bible things by Bible names. I ain't no creed but Christ, me bucko, in the silence of scriptures. Okay. Uh awkward okay so let's look here uh, first bullet the church of christ professes the authority and finality of scripture as inspired by god well that's good next bullet cults quote the bible as an authority uh, oh man but rest it misinterpret it twist it add to it and subtract from it mark 7 verses 7 through 9, Colossians 2, verses 30. Now, that should be 20 to 22. Jeremiah 23, 36, and 2 Peter 3, 16. Next bullet, Church of Christ adopted Campbell's failed methodology for understanding the Bible. And of course, a corrupt heart as well, known as CEI. Direct command, approved example, and necessary inference. So I just dropped the N in necessary, C-E-I. So they reject the principle of biblical interpretation that you always interpret the unclear verses in light of the clear verses. So they, they march by their own, beat of their own drum. The rules don't apparently apply, apply to them. Just everyone else, of course. And then they'll cry foul if you point that out. Oh man, you're picking on me. Okay, well, too bad. All right, so where are we in this? Okay, no comments on this one. All right, this is a good one. We've got our Pharisee and the, the plebeian. Mm. The guy on the right went home justified. No works whatsoever. But the Pharisee was trusting in his many works. So two is background and history. Again, that's what we're looking at. And there's some review, review slides at the bottom. Part 21, you'll want to hit that. I think that was Sola uh, Gloria. I'm not sure which Sola that was in 21. And then part three, we've really hit the rule keeping and all the burdens that you have to bear in the cults there. See the lady with the, uh, the boxes there, the cardboard. And then, of course, all the cults make out Jesus to be a new law giver, not a perfect law keeper. They don't want anything to do with the imputed righteousness and justification by faith. No, he's just giving us a bunch more rules. And that uh, previous slide that you saw, that elder there in the suit, the snake in a suit, well, he'll tell you all the rules you need to follow, tell you whether or not you're approved tell you whether or not you could be baptized, and so forth. Okay, so the bullets, top to bottom, many in the restoration movement are narrow-minded, judgmental, and superstitious Christians. I was a part of the International Church of Christ, uh, a heretical offshoot of the uh, Church of Christ, 
and I was narrow-minded, judgmental, and superstitious to the nth degree. Next bullet, they believe in legalistic patternism and that they attempt to emulate what they think the earliest Christians did in their life and worship. Next bullet, they, they regard the New Testament as primarily a new legal code, the law of Christ, that replaces Moses as the lawgiver of the Old Testament. Next and last bullet, they generally downplay the Old Testament, except in finding passages, of course, in the Old Testament that bolster their own doctrine. So pick and choose, very deceptive. And dishonest, some comments the Pharisees tried to be justified saved, not guilty, but righteous, by externals and works. They attempted to take the works one does in sanctification and use the completion of them as holiness crutches in justification. The cults, including the churches of Christ, do the same. They put sanctification works before justification. Talk about putting the cart before the horse. Humankind is always sought to fill the void with either lawlessness or law keeping. Again, it comes down to a corrupt heart. Both extremes are detestable to God, but biblical faith is the opposite of this kind of self-sufficiency. It fully trusts in the all-sufficient grace of God and Christ alone plus nothing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, three, next uh, uh, in line on our outline here. The gospel lost and then discovered. Oh man, whew, there it is. Okay, and you've got some part one slides that you can talk about the outlandish <laughs> claims of the restoration movement founders, restored the gospel and the church and then the plan of salvation. All lies, all heretical. And then uh, uh, also to the right of that in the review slides at the bottom, uh, there's some of their cultic documents. It's actually in writing. If you say, oh, no, it ain't, tell us, say it ain't so, Mr. Franklin, Sparrow Ministry. I'm going to prove you wrong. Hey, go for it. There's the writings. So did God choose at the very bottom? Did God choose anti-Trinitarians to restore the church? Oh, and by the way, the four co-founders of the Restoration Movement, do you know that they were never baptized for the remission of sins, folks? That's right. They were pedo baptists that's infant baptized. And then they received a Baptist baptism, but they were never baptized according to this new ancient gospel discovery for the remission of sins. So it's not only did God choose anti-Trinitarians to restore the church, did he choose four co-founders, unsaved, unregenerate, lost and dead in their sins, to also discover the gospel and the plan of salvation? Again, they've never been baptized for the remission of sins or anything according to what the Church of Christ teaches it today on baptism. Sorry. Okay, so top to bottom on the right, Church of Christ, consider Campbell's gospel discovery. This is one big sentence, isn't it? Almost like Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. It's one giant long sentence in the Greek. Let me read this, and you can just look at the images. Church of Christ, consider Campbell's gospel discovery, plan of salvation, patterned worship, and other writings to be an ongoing source of truth and authority. Non-essentials become essentials, don't they? And this has led to countless divisions and factions within the sect. So sad, isn't it? Okay, so some comments on this one. Uh, let me see where we are on the outline. And I think on this one, there are none. There's none on this. I'm trying to read really small print. Okay, so the gospel lost and then discovered. I love this one. Look at that picture. Man, it's not prejudice if you call it religion. A little kid there, they, they raise up their kids in these children's ministries and indoctrinate them. Now, God told us to hate you. And throwing barbs and rocks at other Christians. At the bottom there, you'll want to review, perhaps, part 16, where I went through the five solas. I think that's where they began. And then the Church of Christ are at war with Orthodox Christianity, and that's small case O. 
In other words, biblical, evangelical, Protestant Christianity. They're at war with the church, folks. And uh, there's some good review slides. Okay, so the gospel lost and then discovered bullets top to bottom. Campbellites teach, they actually teach church apostasy. And we've covered that at length. So do the other cult, Seventh-day Adventists. International Churches of Christ and probably all the others. Next bullet, history shows Campbell claimed to have restored the New Testament church in 1811 and the ancient gospel in 1823. Well, as evangelist Walter Scott put it, this so-called plan of salvation, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized for the remission of sins, literal, by the way, put it into practice for the first time in 1827. That's baptismal regeneration, by the way. States Scott, quote, in 1827, the true gospel was restored. And for distinction's sake, it was styled the ancient gospel. That's Walter Scott, the gospel restored in his preface. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at Walter Scott. Now, last bullet. All other groups are considered to be in error, lost, and apostate. Alexander Campbell considered Scott to be the, quote, the first successful, successful proclaimer of this ancient gospel. <laughs> okay. Uh, whoa. Okay, that's quite a lofty thing. So, And remember that one true church flyer. It's only 40 cents if you want to buy it, right? <laughs> that's expensive kindling, isn't it? That's all I'd use it for. All right, so here's some quotes, uh, comments here, excuse me. The Church of Christ has been at war with Orthodox Christianity, again, lowercase o, for over 200 years. They accuse all evangelicals of practicing cheap grace, and they slur Baptists continually by saying they practice dead faith or intellectual only faith as being enough for salvation. These are deadly lies. The dogs of legalism, knocking over trash cans, biting God's blood-bought children, causing mayhem wherever they go, Philippians chapter three. So Campbell became a magnet for rebels during the 1800s. That's also a part of history because he himself was a rebel, delving into speculative theology rather than sound doctrine. The Presbyterians wanted nothing to do with him, so he slithered away to the Baptist. Then he quit the Redstone Baptist Association before they fired him and formed his own sect. And Thomas Campbell, by the way, was censored by the Presbyterians. Alexander Campbell was never a Baptist. Don't let him tell you that. Never, ever, ever was he. Hmm. Anyhow, during that time, a couple of Campbell's disciples became dissatisfied that Campbell's restoration movement, well, it wasn't going far enough quick enough. So they formed their own cults. Hi, grab the wheel. It's mutiny, me boys. <laughs> All our hands on deck are fast, ye land lovers. Now, lad, is no cheap grace here. Well, case in point, one of his disciples, Sidney Rigdon, write it down. Sidney Rigdon was an early leader in the Mormon church, and a guy named John Thomas founded his own cult, the Christadelphians. These heretics were Campbellites at first. <laughs> the Church of Christ is every bit as cultic as the Mormon church. Nevertheless, an explosion of new religious movements, cults, and sects were the inevitable outcome of Restorationism and their departure from orthodoxy and creeds. Their Enlightenment thinking I call it stinking thinking, was that creeds and doctrines divide and are thus bad. So they buried their heads in the sand, na 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 na, like little kids putting their, you know, plugging their ears, buried their heads in the sand and came with, up with a magical fix and pushed the reset button to usher in utopia and agreement among all the various churches. Let's unite under one banner. Die as long as you agree with Alexander and his views, me buckos. Well, if not, what do modern Campbellites start doing? Well, they even teach their kids. 
They start hurling rocks. Hi, this cheap grace, faith only and easy believism. All false labels, by the way. Okay, uh, section four here on the outline. Church of Christ uses Alexander Campbell as an inspired source of truth. Now, whether or not they're literally using him uh, or just it's implicit or it's a lens that's covered their mind, uh, you know, they're using him. He is an inspired source of truth. Okay, now I'm going to read that uh, the little caption there on the right of this banner. It says, the devil is not anti-religion. Oh, no, he's anti-Christ. He has devised so many religions to blind people of the truth of God's gospel. And again, that's what this ministry is about, teaching the true gospel. Part one, you might want to review. Our worldview is colored by the method we use to understand the meaning of Bible texts. You have to understand the true gospel in order to spot a counterfeit. Okay, bullets top to bottom. First bullet, instead of testing Campbell's theories and doctrines, okay, uh, doctrinal interpretations by scripture, well, they use them alongside of scripture. And these are idols of doctrine go alongside the gospel. They're so subtle. And they should test them outside the tradition of their group. Bible.org, Got Questions is a Good Start, Grace to You, you know, whoever you're into, Dr. David Jeremiah or whatever. But again, go outside the tradition of your special group if you really want to learn and test. Mm. Okay, next uh, bullet. Sola Scriptura for the Church of Christ means that the eisegesis, the personal opinions of Campbell, is illegitimate, illegitimately elevated equal to or greater than Scripture. You want to go with inductive and deductive. Don't ever, ever, ever go with eisegesis. Third bullet, the church then uses these interpretations and theories without ever having established them as truth to undermine other scriptures. They don't test the spirit. They don't go outside their church tradition. It's an echo chamber. Next bullet, this is called the logical fallacy of begging the question. Last bullet, Campbellites assume this truth. And this truth is that baptism is necessary for salvation and the point where your sins are literally forgiven and you're regenerated. And they employ other unproven propositions despite many theological barriers. They accept that as truth and then argue. That's called the logical fallacy of begging the question. They've never proved their core doctrines okay they're false pillars they're false ideas and doctrines so comments here the devil tempted eve by distorting god's words in genesis 3 remember that he said did god really say so when testing don't go to other restorationists to lead you to the truth go outside your campbellite tradition i've said that three times now it's so important and i did the same thing when i was caught in a cult uh, the international churches of christ i'd go to other campbellites other restoration movement writers and other writers coming from the international church of christ and of course they knew all the clever arguments and they had all the same hang-ups too so i never learned about the gospel I never learned the, the five pillars and descriptors of salvation, that justification before God is based on faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, scriptures alone, and glory of God alone. Okay? You'll never learn that in the cults, ever, ever, ever. They reject the solas. Okay, number four, we're continuing on. Church of Christ, now I know there's a lot here, but I'm going to unpack it. That master spirit slide in the middle, you're going to have to look at that yourself. It's like a thought bubble word puzzle or whatever. I just put all the little words that I'd come across when reading about the churches of Christ. And, of course, I've been years and years in the hardline non-instrumental churches of Christ, years and years in the international churches of Christ. I know these cults intimately. <laughs> so um, I know what I'm talking about. Okay, 
Number four, Church of Christ uses Alexander Campbell as an inspired source of truth. That's what we're talking about. He's their prophet and priest and Church of Christ lens. Now that symbol there next to the word lens, I've pointed to the picture, an actual photo of somebody taking a, lens, uh, a, a picture. This is the Church of Christ lens. You see everything within those brackets? Scientific rationalism. Faith equals obedience. Obedience equals faith. And I, a spiritual, sectarian, all that stuff, pharisaical, that's the Church of Christ lens. Okay, so I'm going to read the, the quotes on the left here. I'm, I know I'm moving around, but you can handle it. Um, top to bottom on the left, Campbell's writings and worldview have become the key filter and lens that unlocks the meaning of the Bible for them. Next bullet, they are following a Jesus cast in the mold of his legalistic rationalism, patternism. Campbell, Stone, and Scott all deny justification before God by faith, which is heresy. They reject the Christian gospel. Next bullet, Mr. Campbell rejected the entire doctrine of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Campbellites today reject salvation by placing trust in the Savior and falsely label this as salvation by mere intellectual assent. It's a terrible slur. Okay, keyword is trust. So they also reject that God responds by giving us new birth through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They reject that too. That comes upon us at conversion, the moment one exercise saving faith. They don't believe in anything called saving faith or justifying faith. Everything happens as a baptismal regeneration after God sees you perform the work of baptism. Then after baptism, you get the Holy Spirit false gospel and salvation. Last bullet, all in green, Church of Christ differ from evangelicals in two key areas. One, they reject the supreme authority of the scriptures. And two, they reject the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Little review there. And at the bottom, the Church of Christ are just as cultic as the LDS Mormons. And you can review part one if you like. On the right there, Master Spirit Alexander Campbell. This is from their own writings. I put it in green. See that in the middle? Master Spirit. That's Robert Richardson. He's a Church of Christer. Wrote the memoirs of Alexander Campbell, volume one, page 402. They refer to him as a Master Spirit. And it's also was spoken of such after Alexander Campbell's uh, not end of life celebration. There's not much of a celebration if you're a legalist, right? At his funeral, all right? Alexander Campbell, let's read some of that. Let's just read the first, first two quotes. The head and founder of one of the most important and respectable religious communities in the United States. Memoirs, volume two, page 548. Here's another one. Campbell was the head of the Reformation. A Voice of the Pioneers, published by the Gospel Advocate, page 47. And Wood, Woods called Lewis an authority. Woods Coggill, page 227, goes on and on, right? Prophet and leader. Scary stuff. But I'm going to be talking about the lens. So when I talk about the lens, this is all that stuff, right? Romanism, first law of pardon, second law of pardon, Holy Spiritless, <laughs> anti-theological, all the mental gymnastics, blueprint and formula, I'm saved by what I do, Acts 2.38, only true remnant church. But remember about this lens, they don't know that there's a lens covering their eyes. They don't know that, the, that, those, uh, that there's, uh, how do you say, scales on their eyes. And whoever controls your conscience, in this case, the master spirit of Alexander Campbell, whoever controls your conscience, dear friends, controls your behavior. Say it ain't so. Prove me wrong on that one. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm going to give you some uh, comments on this one. So the Latter-day Saints and Mormons, Joseph Smith, by the way, stole Alexander Campbell's plan of salvation on baptism, and the Mormons use it to this very day. So yes, they're every bit as cultic. Strongholds of false ideas and beliefs pollute the mind. So we're talking about strongholds here. And this happens to Christians as well. And that's why discerning Christians should appeal to the five solas or the guardrails for preaching. You'll never be taken captive by these fraudsters if you do. 
And that's why the heart and soul of the gospel are the five solas of the Reformation. And it's really the heart and soul of this whole series on American cults. And we've covered that in depth. Okay, the chokehold of Campbellism in the 1800s. I'm not sure this is anywhere on our outline, but I thought I'd throw it in there. And again, look at that image on the right. So these ideas and beliefs and interpretations, machinations, eisegesis of opinions of whoever the founder is of your cult, they're imprinted on your mind. You don't see them as, a, as bad. They're literally a tangled religious web, invisible. You don't even know it. You'll deny and argue that you're into work salvation, even though you are, and you don't even understand it. So the chokehold of Campbellism in the 1800s, restorationism, the spawning ground of American cults. Again, they spawned other cults. They were spun up, queued up, and you've got all these other cults, about a dozen of them coming from the false set of ideas and beliefs uh, emanating from the Stone Campbell Scott Churches of Christ. Okay, ground zero. They all vector back to those false set of beliefs in one way or another with few exceptions. So up to and until, and I'm going to read this, up to and until the time of baptism, the group will have already implanted a pseudo Christian belief system. The adherent, that person that's wanting to join the church and get their sins forgiven, they're told. The adherent sees nothing wrong or dangerous with adding a few works to faith in order, they're told, for faith to be effectual. Remember, they don't believe in saving faith. You know, it was Camel that went on and on. Faith is the grand medium, you know, for salvation, but something more is necessary to the actual enjoyment. So blah, blah, blah. So here's a great question to ask any cultist or anyone that claims Christianity. Ask them, are we justified by faith when we exercise trusting, repentant, fiducial faith? You know, you just say this, are we justified by faith when we exercise faith? Simple question, isn't it? Yes will be the answer from someone that is, uh, has responded to the true gospel and is a true gospel preaching church. This common gospel is affirmed by the vast majority of Christendom. The answer will be no, no, we are not justified by faith when we exercise faith from anyone coming from a cult. Seventh-day Adventists, Church of Christ, International Churches of Christ, United Pentecostals, Cuneites, you know, whatever, okay? No, that's a false men-centered gospel, and they're going to give you their big sales pitch, their pseudo-Christian American cult sales pitch. So they're going to say faith is not the sole means of salvation. So, okay. And they're going to go into their conditionalism argument or whatever, however they couch it. And these churches are the Church of Christ, Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christadelphians, Christian Science, Unity School of Christianity, UPCI, uh, United Pentecostal Church or something. Anyhow, International Church of Christ. All cults, they all reject the Christian gospel. At the very bottom, this is super important, talking about strongholds, demonic oppression, and so forth. The moment an idea or false belief has taken hold in the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate it. The cultist does not see this blind spot and thinks they are only following Jesus. Super important. I've been there. I've been so deceived and it's just sad. The Holy Spirit can unshackle you. Pray to God. Okay, the hub, the Church of Christ will go on and on about the hub. That's Acts 2.38, their water gospel. It's actually the whole uh, chapter of Acts. So I'm going to read a um, lot of stuff here, starting top left-hand corner. The Church of Christ insist that a proof text for the terms of salvation should start here, Acts 2.38, rather than in Ephesians 2, and 8 and 9, obviously. The Gospel of John, no, don't start there. Galatians 2.16, no, don't do that one. Romans 4, no, don't look at that. Note, Acts 2 is a historical narrative account and should not be used as the sole text for one's salvation and baptismal theology. Duh. 
Okay, the box below that. It is within this blueprint, this hub, this Acts 238 Water Gospel Hub and formula where the clear stamp of restorationism is unmistakable. The Church of Christ claims to be the only true church, thus all other churches and their practices and forms of baptism are false. At the bottom below the purple hub, Campbellites will torture and pervert any verse in order to establish this water gospel. So this is one of their pillars and reasons for existing. Okay, so five, this is a new section in the last section here of our outline. Campbell's writings are in practice the interpreter of scripture. And there's our curmudgeon, okay? He's a modern day Campbellite. There's our lens, don't forget, that's everything that was in that middle of that slide that we talked about. Whoever controls your conscience controls your behavior. So bullets, top to bottom, Church of Christ views Acts 2.38, the whole chapter really, as the hub of the Bible and the restored gospel with everything else in scripture subservient to that view. Remember, begging the question, they start with this verse and their opinion of it and then seek to displace all the other verses, even the clear ones. Well, that's ass backwards, <laughs> pardon me. Next bullet, adult baptismal regeneration is their central pillar of doctrine. It's a sacramental baptism. Other worship rules follow, such as singing, praying, preaching, giving, the Lord's Supper, and on and on. Church of Christ infer these are eternal moral principles or rules for all time. They're authoritative, man. You better do that or you're going to be smote and smoked by God. Next bullet. In that sense, they have a divine mandate as the identifying mark of the remnant church. They seek to protect that ritual and worship formula as these doctrines set them apart from evangelical Christianity. Man, this is their sacred cow. They're going to protect this hub. Last bullet. This doctrine, along with rigid legalism, mostly pertaining to worship, stand in stark contradiction to the gospel of justification by grace through faith alone. The Church of Christ embrace a false gospel. At the bottom there, in the red box, Church of Christ teach a false gospel. They say we are not justified by faith when we exercise fiducial, trusting, living, repented faith. That's just another step of their many cultic steps to salvation. So some comments, and there's going to be quite a few. Church, evan uh, church evangelists and elders take great liberty with the biblical text by paraphrasing in a way that incorporates Alexander Campbell's teachings into the meaning of scriptures. They do it all the time, creating contradictions and distortions of other Bible verses. Uh, let's see. In fact, this is the title of James. Okay, so this is a quote here from a Bible book by a Campbellite, the hub of the Bible. Quote, in fact, this is the title of James D. Bale's exposition of Acts 2. The book is called The Hub of the Bible. Rosemead, California, Old Paths Book Club is the publisher, it looks like, in 1960. Bales, a PhD from UCLA, was professor of Christian doctrine at Harding University, Searcy, Arkansas, a Churches of Christ school. Well, again, Church of Christ inscribe, I mean, they're really into this. <laughs> they inscribe Acts 2.38 on their tombstones. This is their Big Mac and spiritual portal. Claim to fame. Wouldn't you think a more central guiding text for the rest of Christianity would be like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, say, by grace through faith, apart from works, so that no one can boast? Or maybe John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that gave the only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Wouldn't you think so? Not with the restorers. So where do the Church of Christ get their soteriology, their salvation doctrine? Well, for starters, let's answer that. For starters, plastered all over their websites from coast to coast, literally hundreds of them, it says, quote, this is something I just picked off, one of them, quote, the Bible shall be interpreted. 
using the approved method of command, example, and necessary inference. Okay, end of quote. Wow, it's a command now. Man, you better not break that rule. Here's a telling blurb from the Restoration Quarterly, page 22, volume 37, number 1, article 2, Hermeneutics in the Churches of Christ by Thomas H. Ulbrich. And I've talked to Thomas before, a pleasant man, but a card-carrying Campbellite nonetheless. Believe it or not, 80 years in the Campbellite movement. So he must be in his 90s and, and must have been converted as a young teen. 80 years teaching and writing, actually. So he's very, very prolific. Quote, this is from Mr. Albrecht. Quote, in the era when bacon and induction were the key, key for unlocking the truth, inference was perceived to be inductive. So this is important. Who's the key? Bacon and induction were the key to unlocking the truth. Ah, the hub, the key. Sounds Gnostic, doesn't it? You, the only way you can understand anything is through the master spirit, the hub and the key and the portal. So I'm going to write, uh, I'm going to continue on with what I am writing. So this is me now. With this magic key and formula coming from the historical narratives in the book of Acts, narrow historical grammatical approach and scientific rationalism Church of Christ venture out to torture and twist what they call obscure and isolated texts that threaten their ritual, their sacramental baptism, their authorized worship rules, their water gospel hub. These texts coming mostly from the Gospel of John, by the way, that's what they attack with this hub club. Along with a bunch of other false ideas of Alexander Campbell, this is their lens, an interpretive grid and they don't even know it. Campbell is their quote-unquote key to understanding the Bible. This kind of Gnosticism, new knowledge, is the most ancient of heresies. Okay? They've made up a rule, unwritten creed, that they're not going to interpret the Bible using any other method than an Enlightenment-era scientific approach and this next statement from Albrecht that I'm going to read has them using the hub of the Bible all throughout the thread of Scripture in order to supposedly understand it. It's not a hub, and a, it's not only a hub and a club, but it's a, a lens. You can't even understand the Bible unless you look through their interpretational grid. Well, Mr. Albrecht continues, quote, and most of their theology theologizing, however, my impression is that spokespersons in the churches of Christ reason from scripture in a deductive manner, arguing from one premise or hypothesis to another so as to arrive, to arrive at a conclusion. End of quote. So what is Albrecht saying? Well, not only is this a key, but Church of Christers, of whom he's a card-carrying Church of Christ or a Campbellite, well, they just go around arguing from one premise hypothesis to another. It's called begging the question. It's a fallacy. It's a logical fallacy of begging the question. And here we have someone that's been in the movement 80 years telling you, man, that's all we do. Talk about a blind spot. So they don't see their own biases and blind spots, spots, folks, and attribute the five-finger plan and hermeneutic approach to that of science, right? That of science, as if to say it's not bad, it's just science and rationalism and grammar. And that was another quote. I didn't want to include that quote from uh, Albrecht, but he, do, he does. He goes on to, to basically say it's not bad, it's science. Anyhow, it's void of theology and the uni unity of Scripture. Like the blind Pharisee, they reject justice and mercy and the love of God. Mr. Alexander Campbell's ancient gospel hub, which encapsulates the wrath of God and divine ret retribution for anyone, anything unauthorized, well, that's their legal code. And that strange fire, they say, will smote you if you don't follow the rules. Remember Aaron's son, Nadab? Nadab and Abihu, Church of Christ teach that Old Testament strange fire that God's going to smoke you, fry you like bacon. 
If you don't worship their way, and if you don't, if you're not baptized in a regeneration way for the literal remission of sins, and then you receive the Holy Spirit. That's literally, folks, what the legalistic, patternistic Church of Christ teaches. There's 800,000 of these members polluting the United States and the rest of the world with this garbage, this false man-centered gospel and salvation. Albrecht's statement where he says, quote, arguing from, from one premise to another, end of quote. Again, that's called the logical fallacy of begging the question. Neither Albrecht nor any of his colleagues have established it. That baptism is the point where your sins are literally forgiven and a person is regenerated as being true yet. Note, restoration debaters are notorious for not defining terms within biblical limits and bringing in their own personal assumptions as established truth when interpreting the scriptures. This isn't inductive or deductive, but the great error of Jesus. The Church of Christ bring in their own opinions as being equal or greater to that of scriptures. Shame. Shame on you. So, according to the Church of Christ, there is only one way to interpret the scripture. The hermeneutical lie of CEI. And there is only one central hub for understanding salvation and the design of baptism, which is their patternistic, legalistic blueprint and formula of Acts 2 especially Acts 2.38. This isn't a hub, but a club used to spiritually harass, mislabel, and sling mud at other Christians who don't hold to a sacramental baptism and work salvation formula. The Church of Christ are deluded perfectionists, in my view, and their hub and spiritual portal is simply a way to bash the greater Christian church who uphold the common gospel. Let's be clear about this hub if baptism is necessary for salvation, then we're not justified by faith. We're justified by faith in a ceremony, by faith in water, by faith in a condition, maybe Sabbath keeping, headdresses, dietary law, snake handling, by faith in the fruit of faith, etc. The Bible clearly teaches that this eternal life and righteousness is given or imputed to the believer the moment they first heard, understood, and trusted in Jesus to save and forgive them. Romans 3 through 5. That's the response to the gospel. So here's another consideration regarding, regarding this hub, folks. Remember this rule. Never get your theology from any one salvation narrative in the book of Acts. Well, these are some, these are the reason why there are summaries of speeches. Bible interpreters of all stripes will affirm this, by the way. We must look to the entirety of God's word and use the simple, clear passages, such as the whosoever verses in the Gospel of John, to help us understand the more complex. The Church of Christ ignores this widely adhered to guideline and instead uses their muddied and erroneous interpretation of a complex passage, Acts 2.38, which they accept as the gospel truth and standard. They then use that quote-unquote truth as a baseline for understanding the simpler passages. That's right. The complex must be used to understand the simple. Again, that's asked backwards. This is dangerous and fraught with problems. The conclusions reached will, will surely contradict the message and overall meaning of Scripture. Using clear Bible passages to shed light on the not-so-clear is a common Bible interpretation methods, method for Christ-centered churches of all stripes. But churches that abuse their flock consider themselves an exception to the rules, man. We're the one true church. We're the remnant church. Don't you understand? Don't you see our enlightened view? Don't you get it? No, we don't. We test the spirits and we trust in God and we read the Bible in context. So if you feel the religious chokehold of restorationism smothering any hopes of experiencing God's grace or walking by the Spirit, well, <laughs> you're not alone. Finally, the hub passageway is where the Church of Christ diverges from evangelical Christianity, who believe that good works by Christian believers are merely the result of their genuine faith, 
Well, not so with a restorationist. Pressing that hub button for them, baptism for the literal remission of sins, means they can access spiritual elitism, a deeper life. Campbell's special revelation on a sacramental water baptism is what the Church of Christ individual is banking their eternal destiny on. Imagine banking your eternal destiny on that? Baptismal regeneration and a bunch of Greek word argu arguments coming from a, a heretic, Alexander Campbell, and three of his buddies, one of them his father. Imagine that. So thankfully, Jesus came to give us something entirely brand new. Says Paul in Romans 10:4, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. As Philippians 3, 9 says, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. But the dogs of legalism will have nothing to do with salvation as a gift. They stumble over grace. They're out to bash other denominations in the most obnoxious manner and impose their narrow-minded and, un and unscriptural views on other blood-bought children of God. Okay, fact, fact, fact. There are two sources of authoritative truth in the Church of Christ, and this will be the end. The first one is the Bible, and they'll die. Amen. High fives. Right? But on the right, they will not admit to this. Here's Alexander Campbell, and there's that lens. So realize there's a multi-layered complexity to this deception, legalism, Gnostic thinking, false ideas, and so forth. Alexander Campbell beliefs his beliefs, ideas, and writings that contradict the gospel. That lens. Okay, number one, they won't admit to this, but number one, this is the second source of authoritative truth in the cults. Number one, the moment an idea or false belief has taken hold in the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate it. We learned about that. The cultist does not see this blind spot and thinks they're only following Jesus, actually believes God is cooperating with them in this Galatianistic endeavor. Two, that nearly invisible matrix that is superimposed over your conscience becomes the lens through which you view all matters of faith and obedience. And here you have two really nice ladies. Of course we go by the Bible only. Thomas and Alexander Campbell, Stone and Scott, well, they were just the co-founders of the restoration movement. So this is really interesting on a psychological level. Also, a denial is very strong, isn't it? So we can convince ourselves all the while. And when I was in a cold, I did too. I really thought I went by the Bible only. But no, there's other sources of truth in the cults. So anyhow, uh, some comments and then we'll finish up. A hardcore, lifelong Campbellite will likely never admit to themselves now they are holding to doctrines that undermine the gospel. Sadly, they only read, quote unquote, authorized material coming from restorationism viewpoints and consider all other material apostate. In fact, I'm a false teacher and an apostate because I believe in the five solas of the Ref Reformation. And you are too, by the way, if you believe that uh, faith saves. You're an apostate. In fact, I am teaching false doctrine. I just said that at this very moment. Many live their entire earthly lives inside this sectarian echo chamber, never experiencing the grace of God. This is tragic. So there are four primary founding fathers of the restoration movement. This cannot be stated strongly enough. Oddly enough, not one of them ever obeyed the ancient gospel, which was supposedly restored on November 18th, 1827. That's when Walter Scott baptized William Amend. And see the life of Elder Walter Scott by William Baxter, page 109, if you should doubt. Thus, God supposedly used four unsaved and unregenerate men who were never baptized unto the remission of sins to number one, Restore the New Testament church in 1811 and two, discover the ancient gospel and five point plan of salvation in 1823 and then three, well, 
put it into practice just four years later in 1827. To be clear, according to Church of Christ Doctrine on Baptism and Salvation Today, none of the founders of the Restoration Movement were even Christian. And as I've said many times, legalism will make you out to be the worst of what? That's right, hypocrites. So let's review. Let's review. Let's review. Number one, authority of Scripture. The Church of Christ claimed the Bible as their ultimate and sole source of authority. Well, yet it is Alexander Campbell and his rationalistic interpretive grid that is the key to unlocking the true meaning of Scripture for them. Does his peculiar interpretation of certain scripture control your life? Why do the cults quote the Bible as an authority, but then proceed to rest it, twist it, misinterpret it, add to it, and subtract from it? Two, religious captivation. With no assurance of salvation in this life or the next, adherents of the Church of Christ have a superstitious attachment to Alexander Campbell and other Church of Christ co-founders. This includes Mr. Campbell's novel system of doctrine and flawed Bible interpretation methodology, the hermeneutical lie of CEI. Hardline Church of Christ believers are spiritually in a state of demonic oppression. This false gospel, these strongholds, by the way, this false gospel has the stamp of a different spirit. It engenders fear, insecurity, and guilt. Three, essential doctrines. The Church of Christ preach a different gospel, incompatible with the core gospel truths we find in Scripture. They are not merely an error on some minor point of doctrine or practice. No, their teaching fatally corrupts the gospel and salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Don't fall for the Acts chapter 2 Bible hub sales pitch, folks. It's a scam. Four, unlocking Bible meaning. Campbell's loophole to the gospel religion and a life of faith saw one big pattern in Acts chapter 2, a formulaic frame, framework, a hub, a blueprint for salvation. Restoration, quote unquote, revelation sees Mr. Campbell as their master spirit and has caused them to place their unity in a pattern. <laughs> Jesus is reduced to following a mere pattern. They have lost sight of the person of Christ. One has to get the pattern just right in order to be saved and, and avoid that strange fire. This is, wrong, this is the wrong Christ of pattern theology. Five, one true church. The Church of Christ grooms its members explicitly or, or implicitly uh, to believe that their earthly visible organization is virtually synonymous with the body of Christ. Remember the Jules Miller film strips and that 40 cent uh, little flyer there? It says it right there, one true church. They groom that, folks. In essence, you're not a Christian if you do not belong to their group because the church of Christ is the body of Christ. Only the church of Christ is the true remnant New Testament church on earth. No other groups are saved, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, or otherwise. Finally, the Holy Spirit does not cooperate with the formation of the invented system and doctrines of the cults, even if much of what they teach is orthodox. Hey, if you want to be a modern-day Campbellite, an Adventist, or an international church of Christer, that's fine. But don't make it a requirement to be saved by and damn everybody else, because that's just what they do. That's it on the topic of American cult Christianity, part 33. And we'll take a look at part two of three in the next video. Thank you for viewing and be sure to check out my website and ebook series on the International Church of Christ at sparrowministry.com or order the books directly from my Amazon.com or Amazon.com author page. Also, uh, they're available in other formats. If you don't have a Kindle device, no problem. The website has other formats that will work on your PC, smartphone, Chromebook, and tablet.